Cool. So I've got a lot of stuff. So I'm going to set this down here. Ugh, okay. It wasn't actually that heavy. I just made it sound like that. But we've been talking about these things the last couple of weeks, right? I know we've talked about, what, anger and insecurity the last couple of weeks. Matt spoke last week. Can we give him a hand for it? Yeah, Matt. Thanks for bringing that word last week, uh, setting up. I don't, he, he, said, he walked up to me. He said, uh, you better not outdo me. I'm, I don't think I can because he's fantastic. So um, thank you for bringing that, Matt. We've, we've seen, uh, I saw, I've heard you've seen a mirror in here. Um, and, a, and a couple items. I have an item for you as well. So um, I just want you to know all of these things that are currently on this box I've wrestled with in some um, form or fashion, and the Lord has been really good to heal. And so to be able to carry a bag up here and uh, lay it before you, like I, I know that through the cross, like this bag, baggage is taken. And so I'm excited to talk about that this morning. But you want to see what's inside? Okay. It's not a magic box. I'm not going to jump into it like Mary Poppins or anything like that. I had a trouble opening this in the first service. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay, what's inside? Okay. It's a, it's a photo. Don't worry. <laughs> Nothing big. So this, if, uh, if you can't see it, is a photo of me and my dad. And this was my first day of elementary school. And uh, so if you want to see it up close later on, I'd be happy to show you. I'm a cute little girl with, like, uh, a striped shirt and flower shorts. And this is me and my dad right before. It was his first day of work um, at a new job, and it was my first day of school. And um, I brought this to share with you guys because um, right in here, life is good for me. Uh, there's not much to worry about. Um, I don't regret much. I don't feel shame about it. I'm just a happy kid. But from, from this point to where I am now, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened, um, whether that as a result of my own sin or someone's sin against me. Man, I've been hurt. I've been scarred. I regret things. I feel shame about stuff. Uh, the enemy has put, had put lies in my mind about who I was. Um, this little girl was confident, um, but th through the years not knowing Christ, she'd become unconfident in who she is. But the power of Christ is that I stand before you today, reconfident in all of those things. Um, but it reminds me of where I've been. It reminds me of the low places that I that I had been at, but also the incredible victories that the Lord has had on my life. And so this is why I bring this to you. And and I don't know if you guys have a photo like this somewhere in your uh, photo books or scrapbooks or, or whatever it is you might use. It reminds you of the good old days. But this reminds me of the good old days before. Um, felt hurt before I felt pain, before I felt shame about who I was. Um, and so that is, uh, that's what I bring to you today, um, a photo of the past. And, and some of you might look at photos from your past and feel a lot of regret for the things that happened um, in your life, maybe things you've done, maybe things that have been said to you or that you have said to somebody else. I don't know where you walk in here with. Maybe um, shame is so heavy on you. Um, that you believe that uh, you are what your shame is. Um, and so not only are, do you, are you that action, but you are that heart. And so wherever you're at today, I have a powerful testimony for you. So have you ever noticed um, it, when you're in an airport, it's fun to people watch, right? I love people watching in an airport. And what I love to see is that one person that's an overpacker. I don't know if, if you look out for... If, if, you might also be the overpacker, and I watch for you. Um, so they have all of these bags. They're, there's like a bag on top of the rolling bag, but then they also have one over their shoulder that's like falling down to their elbow, so they're like walking like this. And then they drop something, and then they have to like pick it up and end up dropping other things. It is just not a good day for that person. Um, I watch for those people because I think it's funny. Um, uh, I think it's funny to watch them drop stuff, and sometimes I help them. Uh, I should probably help them more. Lord, forgive me for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, we see those people that have way too much to carry, uh, and they're dropping things all over the place. They have to go back um, the way they came just to pick up the things that they dropped along the way. And if you're that person, it's okay. I've also been that person too. I overpack, but we're prepared for everything. Um, but we also have to pay the extra charge to check our bags. So um, that's just how it is. Uh, it, it, just like overpacking for a trip, I think in our life we allow things like anger and insecurity to pile up, um, and it makes us unable to function 
but it, it might be all that we know at the time because we've been carrying it for so long, it feels like it's a part of us. Um, the, the, the big suitcases of life, of things that you carry, especially regret and shame, they can become who we are. And so not only do I feel shame, but I am shameful. Everything I do is a mistake. Um, it, it can become like that, and we can get wrapped up in these lies. Uh, one for me, it, it actually started as a kid, is, um, is I felt shame for not being smart, right? Um, so there were these classes in elementary school where you like, got to go take, be taken out of class to go into like the smart class. If you guys were in the smart class, you're smart. I envied you. Um, I wanted to be in the smart class, but I have this thing called test anxiety, and um, it's not helpful in getting into the smart class. So I wanted so bad to be in the smart class that every time I took the test to be able to be in that class, I always failed it because I was so, so anxious. Um, and it became a piece of my identity of like, I am the one who never gets in. Um, and so therefore, I'm not smart. And I held on to that, and it affected me for a very long time. Um, and it became, it became this thing that I picked up as a child in war. Um, it, sometimes I said, well, I'm just not smart, so that's why I didn't get a 100. I got a 99 on my test. Uh, <laughs> some of you are like, well, that's a, still a good grade. But I wasn't in the smart class, okay? I wasn't in the smart class, and that's all I wanted to be. I wanted to be in the class of people who I thought were the best. Um, and I carried shame for not being in that, and I carried it for a long, long time um, until the Lord told me that you don't need to be smart. You just need to be faithful. And, um, and he has worked a powerful thing. And so um, we carry. We carry shame. We carry regret. Um, and God didn't intend for us to live like this, to make this thing such a part of who we are that we, we carry this backpack, if you will, of weight everywhere that we go. Or, or we, we love our baggage because without the baggage, um, we don't know who we are. And so uh, when, we pick, when we pick up regret and when we pick up shame and carry it wherever we go, it's an added unnecessary weight that we feel like is all we have because that's our identity. I'm telling you today, there's a new identity to be had that doesn't carry this weight. Let's look at the, the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3. So if you go to the first page of the Bible and then you flip it, Genesis 3. Got it. <clears throat> so this is right after the fall. Genesis 3, 10. So um, Adam and Eve have just eaten the fruit of the garden. God is looking for them, and he asks, where are you? Um, but Adam and Eve are hidden um, behind some bushes and have co made coverings for their, from themselves uh, with fig leaves because they realize that they are naked um, because they have now the knowledge of good and evil, which is not good. Um, so in verse uh, in verse 9, God is calling to man, and he says, where are you? And then in Genesis 3, verse 10, here's Adam's response. He says, and he, Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I want us to pay attention to this verse because right from the very, very beginning, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. I was ashamed to be in your presence. And because I was naked, I hid myself. The first thing we need to know about shame and regret is that, it, one, it is a result of sin, and two, it isolates and hides us from God who's calling out, where are you, where are you, where are you, even in the beginning. I, do you think Adam and Eve regretted eating that fruit after the consequences they got? I would. I think they felt shame of like we're the ones that got kicked out. Yeah, I would. Um, I, I that in that moment from the very beginning, you see how shame and regret enter the story, and it has been part of the story for each and every one of us since then. We're caught in this pattern, no matter how small or big the regret and shame are. They're still a part of who we are. So they are a res direct result of sin. And what, does, what do Adam and Eve do? They hide. Their first reaction to shame and to regret is to hide from God. Not that God was hiding from them, but they heard him in the garden openly saying, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And what do they do? They run. 
Folks, God's not hiding from you. Sometimes in our shame and regret, we hide from him. But he's calling, where are you? Where are you? What are you gonna say to him today? And it might look different for all of us, but I think shame is fueled a lot by regret. You see, let me, let me just pause right here because we need to get something straight. There's a difference between two words in scripture, and those two words are guilt and shame. Uh, some of you may have heard this, but for those of you in the room who haven't, this has been a huge piece of understanding um, how we take these things to the cross. Shame comes after who you are as a person, who you are. Yes, it's because of what you do. Um, it feeds off of that, but it tells you who you are. Guilt, guilt is a way that the Lord convicts us of the things that we've done of the sin in our lives and actually draws us to God. And so when you feel that, if you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you feel that guilt um, in your stomach, um, I, I, that's where I feel it in my stomach, that, and if you are drawn to the Lord and want to run to him, that's guilt. And that's guilt that leads you to salvation, that leads you to freedom, and all of those things. Now, we see in Genesis, that's not what was happening. There was shame involved. Shame is different because shame causes us to want to run from God and hide from him because we don't feel worthy to be in his presence, and that is a direct lie from the enemy. The Lord wants you to run to him in your guilt and your sin. But the lie of the enemy that seeps in about shame wants us to hide from the Lord. And so I want to make that clear in these moments. In the garden, there was shame. But the guilt that draws us to the cross and draws us to redemption, that's what we want to go after. That's what we want to go after. But this shame looks different, but it always says this. Yes, you made this mistake, but you are this. It's not by your actions, it's by who you are. That's what shame says. And uh, so we've regret decisions that we made or things we've said, um, but we can also carry this um, into all of our sin and all of our decisions. And so um, there's statements like this that describe shame. I have told lies. Have you guys told lies? Sh guilt would say, okay, put those lies um, before the Lord and let him redeem those. Shame says, therefore, I am a liar. That's who I am. That's an identity piece of me. Uh, maybe Here's another one. I've abandoned someone before or something. Therefore, I am an abandoner. I think that's a word. Um, I've given into temptation, so therefore, I am weak. I've understood that one before in my life. I've chosen against God, so I cannot become his. That is shame. In your life and there is no place for it. these are lies from the enemy that trap you from the fullness of freedom that you can have with Christ and not only does it affect you in your own heart but it affects those around you especially when you hide look at Genesis chapter 21 we see another piece of the puzzle in the story of Sarah Abraham and their servant girl Hagar so uh, we we know this Sarah or Sarai at the time, was unable to conceive. And so she goes to Abraham and says, I'll give you our servant if you take her as your wife, conceive with her, have a child, and it will be like our child. Then, come to find out, um, Sarah can have kids. Woo! Um, and that's a whole other story in itself. So then you have Ishmael, the son of Hagar, the, the Egyptian slave girl. And then you have Isaac, the son of Sarah. And so this is where we find um, this story right here, starting, uh, this is Genesis, Genesis 21, verse 8. And the child grew, that's Isaac, and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, so that's Ishmael, um, th who she had bore to Abraham laughing. For some reason, Ishmael thought this was funny. Uh, so she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. So here's what's happening here. I think there is some regret on Sarah's part that she's acting in. Maybe she regrets giving Hagar to Abraham uh, because now they're living in a promise that she acted too quickly on. Um, and so in this moment uh, where she feels 
like Isaac is making fun of her son. She's so serious about the heir of Abraham and continuing that line that she is willing to let both Hagar and Ishmael go into the wilderness because of this one action of Ishmael. But I think that there was some regret growing there in the very beginning. Maybe some regret of letting Hagar become Abraham's wife. Maybe some regret of keeping them in their household. Maybe some shame on her part where she wasn't patient um, with, on, in the Lord's timing. Whatever it was, um, it caused harm to the people around her. It affected Hagar and it affected Ishmael. And they were sent into the wilderness right then and there to survive on their own. It absolutely affects the people around you when you continue um, to act in this sin of shame and regret. But, but here's the good news. When we face God with shame and regret, instead of being met by this harshness, maybe that we see from, from Sarah in this story, we're met with something completely different. God is a God of grace and of mercy. We see this all throughout Scripture. All throughout Scripture we see this. Um, here's, a, here's a fun story. So this little kid, she grew up some. I, this was my, like, sweet days. Then I had my sour days. So that's where I got really good at running backwards. Um, if you don't know what that means, my parents really loved to use the uh, spanking method as, uh, with me as a kid. And so I knew if I did something wrong, some heat was coming from the hand of my father. And um, it, he did it out of love. But I, knew, I would know it was coming. I got it so much, I knew. I was like, I did that wrong. And I would legitimately get really good at running backwards like this. And so uh, I had my running backward days because I knew in a moment, oh, I regret that decision because the hand of the Father is coming. And that's, that's actually how I saw God for a lot of, of my years. Like as soon as I did something wrong, I, one, immediately regretted it, and I wanted to hide. Why? Because I thought the wrath of God was coming against me, and that was a hot hand. Um, and that's how I saw God. But I, I came to realize that it was so, so different um, than that. So, so different than that. And, and we see this, again, in Genesis. Um, God, God does something really cool in Genesis chapter 3. Let's look there again. If you want to go back to Genesis 3, we're in verse 21 um, this time. And so this is after, uh, after the fall, after God says, where are you? They, he realizes that they ate from the tree. He gives this long punishment to man, woman, and the serpent. Um, and then this happens, verse 21. <clears throat> so they get there. Uh, they get their punishment, and then verse 21 says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. I want to pause here for a second because that helpless like sheep without a shepherd, and so pray for them. Pray for their souls. Pray for their hearts because they need this covering of my Holy Spirit and of my blood. They need me they don't know yet. And so pray earnestly for more people to go tell them and more people to go tell them so that more may come and that more people will tell because they need to know that the kingdom of God is here. And I've come to wipe away the shame and the regret that will come as a result of sin and will hurt the people around us. That's what I've come for. Jesus himself in his coming, and I want to look specifically at the cross. Yes, he lived a perfect and sinless life, got up close to people, but he conquered something powerful on the cross. We know that that is our, our salvation. Those of you who don't know that he conquered the salvation, your salvation on the cross for him, I want you to trust in that today because that's free. But what he also did is he took this sh hidden shame in all of our lives causes us to want to hide from his voice calling out, where are you? He took the hidden shame and he put it on public trial. He brought the thing that wants to hide out and he made it not hidden anymore on the cross. Let's look at uh, Colossians chapter 2. It says this pretty plainly, verses 13 through 15. It says this, and you, 
us who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all trespasses. That's what God did. Made us alive, forgave all trespasses. Verse 14, how did he do this? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us and its legal demands. He set all of this aside. All of the sin, all of the shame, all of the regret. And uh, he, he nailed it to the cross, is what the end of verse 14 says. He set it aside, absolutely putting it on public execution and trial, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers. And in other versions of scripture, it says the evil authorities and, the, and other authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them by him or by the cross other versions would say. You understand what happened at the cross. Yes, salvation. Yes, freedom. But, but Jesus himself put shame to shame. He pulled it out of its hiding once and for all so that we might be pulled out of our hiding once and for all. What was once clothed in animal skin to cover the shame of Adam and Eve is now covered by the blood of Christ once and for all. So when we look at the regret and shame that undoubtedly are in all of our lives, when we look to the cross, it is absolutely wiped clean because he took all of our trespasses on himself, set it aside, and nailed all guilt, shame, and regret to the cross so that we might live forever with him, not sacrificing us, but sacrificing for us because he loves us that much. He disarmed the spiritual authorities. There's no more arrows pointing at us. The Lord broke them in half. Jesus, hear this about Jesus. He carried no regret to the cross. No regret. He left that in the garden. Remember the prayers that he prayed there before he went to the cross? He left his regret there for the cross. And he said, the scripture says he looked down on shame while he was on the cross. He was dying and had the whole weight of all the sins of humanity. And in that moment, he looked down on shame and says, I'm conquering you now and forever. In that moment, Christ won the victory over shame and regret on the cross. And so your shame is the very thing that Jesus wants to redeem today. If we go back to that passage in Genesis chapter 21, remember um, Hagar and Ishmael? Where, where did we leave them the last time we talked about it? Where are they? They're in the wilderness, right? I wonder if uh, Hagar had some regrets. Maybe Hagar had some shame. How did I get into this situation? Maybe Ishmael was the same. Let's see where they're at. Verse 15 of Genesis 21, it says this. And then the water in the skin was gone. She had no water to drink. She put the child under one of the bushes, and then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, and then she said this. She cried out to the Lord. Let me not look on the death of my child. Please don't kill him. Don't let me be able to see that. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. She regretted not having anything to take care of her son. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? God met her there. Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And then the Lord opened her eyes. She saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave it to the boy to drink. And God was with the boy and grew him up. And he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness, Quran. And his mother took, his wife, took a wife for him in the land of Egypt. The story could have ended verses before it did. 
They were sent into the wilderness, and that was it. We didn't hear of them. But, but the writer of Genesis wanted to include this story for a reason. And I think it's because even in the shame and regret that maybe Hagar was feeling, or the, the mistreatment, per se, from the shame and regret that Sarah was feeling, the Lord met Hagar in that place at the very bottom. She had nothing left to hang her hat on, and she didn't even have water to drink to sustain her. The Lord provided a way to, sus to sustain her and her family. In that moment, the Lord showed up for them. He covered them. He promised them of life that would be continued. And they started fresh. And they started new. And they left the old behind. Hear this today if you don't hear anything else. You may regret the sin that put Jesus on the cross, but Jesus never regretted the cross that he died for you. Never. Jesus has never regretted the cross that you hung him on, that we hung him on, that I hung him on, with my shame and regret of my sin. He has never regretted it. And we, we have great examples of this in Hebrews um, chapter 2. Chapter 12, starting in verse 1, we're actually encouraged. What do we do next? Where do we go from here? We see what Jesus has done. We see the victory on the cross. But what do we do with it? Because we see the victory on the cross. We see what God has done. But yet I'm still carrying around this shame and this regret in my life. Kayla, what do I do with it? There's an encouragement to you today. Out of Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses where the Lord has shown up before, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, almost as if it is who we are. And let us run, run with endurance, not backwards, forwards. With endurance, the race that God has set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, the founder of and the perfecter of our faith from the garden. He was the founder and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And here it is again, despising shame, putting it on open trial, and is now seated at the right hand of God. That's who we can put our trust in. Jesus took the cross with joy that we might be free from the identity of shame. And he has clothed us in righteousness. Just as he has clothed Adam and Eve then, he clothes us once and, once and for all with his righteousness, his love, and his grace. This time it's not an animal. It is the Savior. It's not just a one-time thing. It's once for all. It's a place we can continue to come back to if shame and regret begin to keep creep in. I pray that the Lord um, would convict you in his guilt to bring shame to the cross. Maybe that starts today. And so what do I do with this baggage, the baggage that has just become a part of me, even the baggage that has become a part of me just in this message, and you're wondering why she's still wearing that backpack. That's weird. Here's a point. It's because we have the opportunity today even with shame and regret so a part of our lives that we believe that it's a part of who we are, we're comfortable, comfortable with the weight that we carry. But Jesus says we don't have to carry it. And so the opportunity for you and for me today, is just like the scripture says, what we do with the crosses in front of us, in the example that we have, it says let us lay aside every weight which clings to us and set it down before the cross so we can run the race with endurance because Jesus paid for it joyfully. Jesus paid for it joyfully. I want you to know the cross still stands right now, once for all, in this moment. I want you to know that it is open for you today. I'm going to invite the band back up as well because they're going to lead us in some response time open for you today. At the foot of the cross is where we lay our burdens aside. Jesus conquered it, 
so that we can share in that freedom. And so what does that mean for us? Today, the foot of the cross is open for the Lord to take your shame, to take your regret, and replace it with the fullness of his spirit. So you may not walk in that identity, but walk in the fullness of identity that, that Christ has paid for it all. And so I invite you, and I will be doing it as well, whatever pos- uh, posture you need to take this morning. I can't leave here without giving you the opportunity to respond. I, I, that's just not me. That, that is inobedient of me. And so whatever physical posture you need to take, I don't care if you have to come down and make this your altar. But don't leave here with the regret and shame that you walked in here with because the cross is open and Jesus counts it joy to take that from you today. It's as easy as slipping it off and saying, Lord, I know that you will provide the rest. We'll leave it at the foot of the cross today. What does that look like, Michaela? It means telling the Lord what you're ashamed of. It looks like telling the Lord what you regret and asking for his covering of grace and a new identity this morning. And I think he's willing to give it because he's already been crying out, where are you? We've been the ones hiding. And then uh, he says, come to the cross because it is my joy and pleasure to face it for you. So I, I ask you all, leave regret and shame at the cross today because we were never meant to carry it. We were never meant to carry it. So take the posture you need today. If you need to stand, and that's your posture of declaration if you need to kneel and that's your posture of declaration if you just need to bow your head in your seat and say lord i'm putting this in front of your cross today i don't care what it looks like in your body i'm just asking in your heart that it's at the foot of the cross come to the cross because we need him we need all of him